Your Eminence, I think we can start. I, I will. Uh, Very well. Very well. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, only true master and teacher, on this Lenten afternoon, conscious of our dire need for repentance, we need to review and renew our desire and firm intention to be your disciples. Still, there is room before our mind's eye that frightening image of your apostles fleeing from the terror of your arrest and <clears throat> condemnation. And this brings home to us serious doubts about our own fidelity. In your goodness, Lord, make faithful disciples of us in spite of our weaknesses. Make us instruments of your word. Enable us to resist the urge to run when life becomes difficult and trying. Keep us from turning our backs on the demands of life and make us always ready and able to persevere in our commitment to you, to be true to you no matter what the cost. For you are indeed our God and we give you glory together with your eternal Father and your all holy good and life-giving spirit now and forever and to the ages of ages. Amen. I'm eagerly expecting the good word from Father Sostomus because I find myself uh, wondering a question mark. How do you preach year after year on the theme that comes in the cycle, the ecclesiastical, the Byzantine heritage cycle? How do you make it fresh? How do you become the instrument of that kind of uh, bringing the gospel truth to the world and to the faithful without becoming uh, the center of, oh, he's a good preacher, he preaches well. But when you ask someone what he preached on, they have a hard time knowing what he preached on. That was the wonderful example of Father Condus Leonidas Condus, he was preaching a, 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 a sermon in um, the chapel. Those days were when the first person landed on the moon. And his title of, this, of, the, of, his, uh, of, his, of his sermon was, Who Owns the Moon? And he, for 20 minutes, in a highfalutin English, spoke to the people, seminarians, theologians, and lay people alike. Well, someone, I'm not going to mention the name, approached one of the lay persons who were in the chapel. He says, she was an elderly lady. So she says, well, she was, he was a fantastic, a beautiful sermon. I was moved. So the person asked him, he says, what really did you get out of the sermon? Well, she said some things, but she could not say exactly what. I find myself to do the same thing every year. And I can imagine the, my brother priests, every time they have to preach on something specific that the church orders us to preach, what do we do? Those are my two cents for today. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Your Eminence. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce to you uh, Reverend Dr. Sostomos Nasis. I will tell you a little bit about him. I don't want to take too much time because I want him to have all the time he needs to speak to us today about Orthodox resources and the things. I won't take too much of his thunder. I want him to say it. But uh, it's important that you know a little bit about who he is. Uh, clearly, he is uh, one of us, you could say. He's a graduate of Hellenic College and Holy Cross. He served the Ecumenical Patriarchate of Constantinople as a writer, translator of the Office of Chief Secretary, local deputy coordinator of the Patriarch's Environmental Initiatives, and the International Dignitaries and Diplomatic Corps Liaison. He completed his doctoral studies at the Theological, Study, the Theological School of the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in April 2006, and subsequently took on teaching positions 
at St. John of Damascus Institute of Theology of Balaman University in Tripoli, Lebanon, and the Supreme Ecclesiastical Academy, the Seminary of Thessaloniki. He currently holds the position of tenured assistant professor of Byzantine liturgy and liturgical sources at the social at the School of Social Theology and Christian Culture at the Faculty of Theology of Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. He is a proto-presbyter and he serves the Church of St. Anthony of the Holy Metropolis of Thessaloniki. Father Chrysostomo, welcome. It's an honor to have you with us and thank you for taking the time out of your schedule at 11 p.m. in Greece. Thank you. Father, your eminence with your blessings. Uh, your grace, Reverend Fathers, allow me to um, thank all of you for being here and for the very kind invitation. It's very moving for me to be here with you on this uh, online seminar meeting and to offer you some thoughts to fathers, to brothers who have the deep honor of offering the homily, the sermon, to our fellow brothers in Christ. So take this, all, all I have to say today with a grain of salt, just as an opportunity for reflection. It gave me the opportunity also to think about some things and hopefully it'll be somewhat useful to you as it has been for me uh, in preparing for this uh, meeting. Allow me to uh, share my screen here. Um, For a moment, let me see. Oh, that's not right. Hold on. Noel is on from OCN as well, Father. So if you need help, you let us know. I should be okay. Let's see here. Let's try this. Can you see the... Um, yes, Father. Yeah, it looks good. Is it yes, going Father. on to the next? Okay. Yes, you're good. So um, the topic that I uh, was asked to present today is um, an attempt to help us identify some of the foundational resources for crafting homilies. Uh, the basis of our reflections has to do with the gospel lectionary system which is, of course, the well-known system of readings from the four Gospels as, as it has come down to us throughout the ages. We'll discuss this, um, how it kind of developed maybe at some point if we have some time. But as Father Chris mentioned, I've already been to the Akathist hymn. You're going to be celebrating the Akathist shortly. I wanted to begin my reflections with a phrase from the Akathist, from the um, ninth ikos, the letter rho in the Greek ac acrostic. It has the following phrase. It's quite powerful if we think about it. Um, according to the hymnographer hymno of the Akathist, the Kondakion of the Akathist hymn, uh, we say at this point, Eloquent orators we see as mute as the fishes. They're as dumb as the fishes. They, they, they're not heard in the present, in thy presence, O Philipotus. So as I was thinking about this, it came to mind that when someone preaches the homily, the challenge is, if I may suggest, the challenge is to maintain that sense of mystical silence before the mystery of the divine economy. In this spirit of mystical silence, the homily is endowed with a sense of gravitas, of weightiness or glory in the Hebrew sense of the word, kavod. This weightiness of the sermon is underscored even by the material structure of the pulpit itself. We know from the well-known Middle Byzantine commentary on the divine liturgy uh, of St. Germanos of Constantinople, which is entitled, 
ecclesiastical history and mystical contemplation that the ambo manifests the shape of the stone at the holy sepulcher on which the angel sat after he rolled it away from the doors of the tomb proclaiming the resurrection to the lord of the lord to the myrrh bearing women so when we stand on the ambo to preach we stand in the place of the angel pro proclaiming the resurrection to all who draw near to the tomb of christ also understood symbolic symbolically as the heavenly throne of the lamb from whence comes that everlasting peace and joy of the kingdom of god the light of the kingdom so the ambo as the stone on which the angel proclaimed the resurrection of the lord to the myrrh bearing women is before us every time we uh, offer a homily we are the angels we stand in the place of the angel um near the the empty tomb of christ which is symbolized by the holy altar table which as we also know is is, is a symbol of the throne of the lamb in the kingdom of heaven and this this may lead us to reflect upon the throne and the worship of the lamb as we see it in the book of revelation and one of the main questions in the book of Re revelation that begins uh, in the sixth chapter is when john relates that vision that he has of god's throne room he describes the lamb on the throne who is handed a scroll with seven seals and when we had the time to reflect with his eminence and his grace and the fathers as we were preparing for this a meeting uh we, we 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 reflected on the gospel lectionary book itself and how we have those clasps and that act the, the action of releasing and opening the book is like the opening of the the seals of the scroll in the book of revelation and in that spirit of the mystical silence we could look at the seventh seal of the scroll uh when uh we read in the book of revelation in the eighth chapter in the eighth chapter verse one that the lamb when he opened the seventh seal there was a silence in heaven for about half an hour so a homily is not judged to be effective by the complexity or verbosity of its formulations but but by the inner peace and communion which it offers to its hearers. As a matter of fact, recently I met with one of the well-known preachers here in Greece, a very revered uh, homileticist, Father, Father Dan Daniel Ayarakis. And I asked him, what, what do you have to say to some of the younger preachers uh, out there? He said, well, in my life, if I wanted to, re if I wanted to change something, it would be, to try to say everything that I said in fewer words. So just that maintaining of that sense of inner peace and tranquility and not trying to overstate things and, 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 and um, just express things in a succinct and clear manner. And this leads us <clears throat> to the reflection of what is the true scope of preaching and a reflection on the minister of the homily so what is indeed the scope and pur purpose of our sermon this is the first point of clarification i wish to make by the way of introduction <clears throat> so when we ask ourselves this question we can come to the conclusion that as we reflect deeply on this issue, there are at least two main objectives of preaching. The first, of course, is evangelization or the proclamation of the gospel. This entails the bringing of the multitude to Christ and to his holy church. And the second, which is quite different from the first, is ecclesial formation. This entails what may be called um, the upbuilding of the body of Christ. Or it could also refer to 
what St. Paul teaches in the uh, epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 11 through, through 13, St. Paul says there, and his gifts were that some should be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So evangelization and ecclesial formation, which are similar yet distinct, can be seen as the two main objectives of preaching. Of course, we also need to reflect on the fulfillment of the ministry of preaching and the effectiveness of the preaching of the gospel that the person who is endowed with the, the gift of offering the homily uh, is to maintain. What are these two spiritual attributes, these two gifts of the Holy Spirit? The first, of course, is simply put, competence. The faithful, I think, need to have a sense that their priest knows what he's talking about, that he's prepared and mindful of their time and intelligence. We cannot hazard being ill-prepared for the sermon. If we are not prepared, we lose our credibility and our access to the minds and the hearts of our parishioners. In this case, I think if we're not prepared, it would be preferable, more preferable to uh, perhaps pass on the homily. It might be more appropriate, so to speak, than just to sit there and say something off the top of our heads. So the priest must be prepared. He must give a sense of competence. He must show that he, he understands the gospel text. He, he's worked through it. He's dealt with it. And he's tried to work out the, 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 connected, the interconnectivity of the gospel text, the message, with uh, the life of his parishioners. Along with competence, the priest must also have a second equally significant attribute, and that is integrity. Father Theodore Stylianopoulos used to tell us at seminary that he, he, he would talk about this young man who went to his father and his father would tell him what to do, but he wouldn't do what he was doing. And he, he told him once, dad, who you are speaks more loudly than what, what you say. So, vios kelogi, our life and our words need to be integrated into one complete whole and not have a, a, not have a cleavage between the two. So, evangelization and ecclesial formation are the two objectives of, of preaching and the two attributes of the pe preacher are competence and integrity. Another very important aspect to keep in mind is the fact that the liturgical homily is given in a specific context. That context is, of course, first and foremost, none other than the divine liturgy. Now, we all know that the divine liturgy is a sacramental rite consisting of both ritual action and oral liturgical prayer. So, we must keep in mind, as we are giving the homily, our movements, our actions, our stance needs to have a liturgical kind of cover to it. It needs to be in sync with the movement of the liturgy, the gestures, the processions, the blessings that we offer. So it's not like as if this, the sermon is distinct from the divine liturgy in which it is embedded. And the second thing to keep in mind is, of course, that the, the language of liturgical prayer also uh, saturates the sermon. The language of our, us, of our sermon, of our homily, should be consistent with the language of prayer offered during the divine liturgy. So these things, these two aspects, ritual action, movement, and liturgical prayer, uh, the text of the divine liturgy, give us the ethos and the content of the liturgical homily, the sermon, 
within, embedded within the context of the divine liturgy. So these are just some initial preliminary reflections on the homily. Now I would like for us to enter into more the sources and the resources that we have at our disposal in order to help construct a proper homily and then also give some insider information, so to speak, on uh, the specific pericopes that we've been reading throughout the period of Lent. Of course, as we turn to these specific resources, we know that all Orthodox priests usually um, take recourse to the um, patristic resources available to us in order to help, help us prepare our sermons. As the Orthodox clergy, you know, we use the wisdom of the fathers, the ancient patristic writings to gain insight and inspiration in, in constructing and in composing our sermons. The study of the patristic exegetical tradition, as we know, is not simply a matter of practicality, but it is also, we would say, a canonical requirement. If we read, for example, Canon 19 of the Council in Trullo, um, Penthecti, the Penthecti Ecumenical Council, or also it's also known as the Quinisex Council, we see that there is there is a need, according to the canon, not to go beyond the limits that have been fixed, nor varying, it says, from the tradition of the God-bearing fathers. And if any controversy regarding scripture shall have been raised, the canon states, let them not interpret it otherwise than as the lights and doctors of the church in their writings have ex expounded it. So the, exp the expounding of the scriptures by the fathers of the church is also a sine qua non, an absolute starting point for the, for the uh, construction and maintaining of the true doctrine of the Orthodox Church. We have, of course, <clears throat> modern scholarship and modern monographs that, helps, that help us open up this, this rich world and this, this, this deposit of uh, the patristic commentaries and the, the homiletical, homiletical exegetical tradition. For example, um, this book that I have here uh, uh, in this slide by Simonetti, Biblical Interpretation in the Early Church and Historical Introduction to Patristic Exegesis, is a, a comprehensive historical survey of Paterici Herminia. The author examines the changing understanding of the word of God in, early, in the early church and describes individual authors or the schools, the so-called school of Antioch and the school of Alexandria, uh, which were active in this, in this development. There are many other books that could be helpful and useful. There's another monograph by Christopher Hall, reading scripture with the church fathers. This book is included in the so-called series known as the Ancient Christian Commentary on Scripture. This is the supplemental volume one. Uh, here, Christopher Hall speaks about, he gives, he gives an apology. So why read the fathers, he asks in this first chapter. He also speaks about the modern mind of biblical interpretation and compares that with the patristic understanding of the scriptures. He um, analyzes some of the uh, exegetical um, presuppositions of some of the fathers of the East, Athanasius, Gregory, Gregory the Theologian, St. Saint, Saint Basil, St. Saint John Chrysostom, and some of the um, fathers of the West, St. Ambrose, Jerome, Augustine, and Gregory the Great. And he also goes into the so-called Alexandrian and the school and the Antiochian school of biblical exegesis. This study is not something new uh, in the church and in the tradition. We see, for example, here in this codex, it's Codex 25 held at the library of the Martin Bodmer Foundation in Geneva. This is a, one of the folia from this manuscript. It's, it's called minuscule 556, according to the numbering of Allen. 
And we find here in the middle, I, I'll try to see if I could use the pen here, the high laser pointer. Here is the biblical text from the Gospel of St. Matthew. Viv los genesios y su Cristo y David y Abraham. So the gene genealogy of Jesus. And here, around here on the, in, the, in the margins, we have biblical, scriptural, patr patristic interpretation of the biblical, of the biblical text. So this is, this is an early, this is a 12th century manuscript. And we find this, the cantana or the floralegia anthologion of patristic commentaries around the biblical text. And this whole codex is full, is full of this. And there's so many codices similar, uh, similarly um, uh, created in the, in, the, in the manuscript tradition. Fortunately, we don't have to go to the manuscripts to, to gain access to some of these <clears throat> patristic witnesses. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the ancient Christian commentary on scripture series has done much in this regard to make, make some of these patristic um, uh, interpretations accessible for us today. So we have books with patristic commentaries uh, on the specific verses from the gospels in this series. So Simonetti and Odin have published a volume on Matthew in two specific tomes, chapters one through 13 in volume A and chapters 14 through 28 in volume B. We have another edition, another volume um, dedicated to Mark, Luke, and of course, John. Here is Alowski's volume on John, his second volume. This is chapters 11 through 21. And just like in the manuscript that I showed you earlier, in this edition, you see here the text that is commented on. And then we have a commentary by um, Gregory of Nyssa and um, Chrysostom and um, some other fathers. I can't really see it right now. Let me see if I can find it here. Uh, Chrysologos and um, Augustine and so on and so forth. So they have little little patristic passages on the, the, the verses of the, of, the, of the Bible. So these are, these, are, these are anthologia of snippets, of interpretive snippets of the fathers in, on each verse of the, of the, of the gospels. In, the, in this series by InterVarsity Press, we also have commentaries on complete books by specific authors. So this is the commentary on John by Clement of Alexandria. It's two volumes. It's been published in two volumes um, by David Maxwell. He translated the, the text of Cyril of Alexandria on the Gospel of John, his, his commentary on John. And Lowski has edited this book. But we also have, you know, the, we all know the Nicene and post-Nicene Fathers series. Um, many patristic uh, writings on the gospels. Here we see, I've selected, for example, just by way of ex example, <clears throat> volume 10, which offers the homilies on the gospel of St. Matthew by St. John Chrysostom and volume 14 um, on the gospel of St. John and the epistle to the Hebrews. Very, we also have the very popular um, commentaries by Theophilact of Bulgaria, he thrived, he flourished at the turn of the 12th century. So we have the publications of the explanations of the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They've been translated into English, of course, as well. So they're accessible to us. Cyril of Alexandria, Gregory of Nyssa, John Chrysostom, Theophilactos of Bulgaria, um, Chrysoloras and all these others, they're not the only ones who have commented on, uh, uh, pr provided commentaries on the scriptures and homilies on the scriptures, on the gospels. Theodora Antonopoulou has put together an extremely important monograph on Byzantine homiletics, authors and texts. It's published in Greek, but it's, it's simple Greek. It's not very complicated. 485 pages of collections and references to um, homiletic material in the Byzantine tradition. 
Byzantine homiletics, authors, and texts. Theodora Antonopoulos, she's a professor <clears throat> at the School of Philology uh, in, in, in the, at the University of Athens. As you, made, you might imagine, the homiletic tradition in the Byzantine church, in the Orthodox church, did not stop on that fret, fret, uh, frightful day uh, in May of 1453 with the fall of Constantinople. We have the post-Byzantine collections of homilies as well. We have many collections that appear in printed editions and in the manuscripts. Of course, we all know the story of Saint uh, Cosmas de, of Etolos, who was that you know wonderful itinerant preacher of uh, the Turcocratia. But we also have many, many, many collections of homilies that have been published. These are just a few from the 18th century and um, in the 19th century up to let's say 1830, in the 1830s, we have at least 18 more homiletic uh, collections of various authors published. This is right before the Greek word of, of independence. So dear fathers, we, we, we are truly heirs of a great procession of preachers who inspire us and allow us to maintain this connect this connection with the early fathers and of course the biblical texts themselves <clears throat> of course along with the patristic scripture uh, exegesis and the patristic homilies we also have resources based on modern scholarship they are known to us from our seminary uh, days the New Oxford Annotated Bible with Apocrypha. It has nice introductions and notes, footnotes that are helpful. The Nestle Allen Greek English New Testament, the New Jerome Biblical Commentary, the Inco Bible Commentaries. There are many other commentaries, Sacra Pagina and what have you. The Theological Dictionary of the New Testament by Kittle. And of course, every priest has in his library, the Orthodox Study Bible. Along with the new Orthodox study Bible, <clears throat> um, I humbly urge you to delve even more deeply into its first edition. And which is the first edition? This is the first edition. It's the Ecloradium itself, the gospel lectionary, the Ecloradium of Constantinople. <clears throat> The Byzantine pericope system is not simply an arbitrary arrangement of biblical texts. Here uh, on this slide, we see a page from the 1745 Venice edition, which was dedicated to the Patriarch of Jerusalem, Chrysantos uh, Notaras. He was one of the people in the previous uh, slide with um, a collection of homilies. Here we see um, the second, the, the Monday, the Tuesday of the bright, of bright Week and Wednesday of Bright Week. In the margins, we see different notes, different marginal notes that help us. These ubiquitous marginal notes are found in all the printed editions, the newer printed editions, and many, many old manuscripts of the lectionary. Unfortunately, we don't have the time today to de help decipher some of these notes. Um, perhaps we'll have an opportunity to do so in the future. For the time being, I would like to simply note that they are based in part on the so-called Eusebian canon tables, also known as the Eusebian apparatus or the Ammonian sections. But this, this whole uh, discussion will have to wait for another, another, another day, perhaps. Going back to the Gospels themselves and the Ecloradion of Constantinople, we know that there are three orderings of the Gospels. First, we have the, you know, the continual text, the, the, the Trivangelon, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If, if you ask anyone which are the four, four Gospels, they'll tell you Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's the, the order in which we find it in the New Testament that are published you know, as a continual text. We have two systems of lectionaries in the Orthodox Church, the old Canonarion of Jerusalem and the Ecloradion of Constantinople. We use the Ecloradion of Constantinople. It's the Byzantine lectionary system. 
I put them in parallel um, columns so we could see that there are differences. For example, in the Canonarion of Jerusalem, John begins on the Sunday of Thomas, not on the Sunday of Easter. It goes to Pentecost, then we have Matthew. Uh, again, uh, uh, excuse me, this is supposed to be Mark from the Feast of the Cross to Theophany. It's not, it's not Matthew. Luke from Theophany uh, up to Great Lent and the Clogadin of Constantinople. We find the order John until Pentecost from Easter, then Matthew until the Feast of the Cross, Luke until Cheese Fair Sunday, and then we read from the Gospel of Mark during Lent. This is the period in which we find ourselves at the moment. What are the readings of Great Lent according to the Clogadian of Constantinople? We see the first Sunday of Lent, we have the calling of Philip and Nathaniel from the Gospel of John. And then from the second to the fifth Sunday, we have, indeed, we have readings from the Gospel of Mark. But why this peculiarity from John in the first Sunday? if we're supposed to be reading from the Gospel of Mark. Why do we have this passage from uh, John, from the first chapter of John on the first Sunday of Great Lent, on the Sunday of Orthodoxy? I don't know if anyone has thought about this at all. Um, many times we see or we hear, her, we hear sermons on this passage, on this pericope and the point that is made is that we see icons and in the pericope itself john 1 46 we see we have this phrase come and see so some have suggested that the phrase from the found in john 146 is the hermeneutical key for understanding why this passage was selected to be read on the sunday of orthodoxy in fact, however, the Sunday of Orthodoxy historically has nothing to do with Great Lent. And the pericope, the pericope as well has nothing to do with the Sunday of Orthodoxy. We all know the history of the feast of the triumph of Orthodoxy, namely that after the death of the last iconoclast emperor Theophilus, his young son, his, his, he was like three, four years old, Michael III, along with his mother, the regent St. Theodora, and the patriarch St. Methodius, summoned the Council of Constantinople held in 843 to bring final peace and resolution to the church, the resolution of the iconoclast controversy. So we know as well that based on chrono, uh, chronography, uh, chronographus of the Byzantine Empire, <clears throat> that at the end of the first session of this council, the patriarch, Michael and his mother and the, the bishops and the priests had a, had a procession, held a procession to, uh, from the church of uh, Panagia Vlachernon to Hagia Sophia. And that's when they restored the icons in the great church. This occurred on the 11th of March, 843, which happened to be the Sunday, the first Sunday of Lent that year. So at the end of the council, they decreed that a perpetual feast on the anniversary of that day should be observed each year on the first Sunday of Great Lent. And that's why we have the Feast of Orthodoxy, the, the, the Sunday of Orthodoxy, the Triumph of Orthodoxy. However, if we look at the Synaxarion of Constantinople, we see that this pericope predates the establishment of the Feast of the Sunday of Orthodoxy. As a matter of fact, according to the Synaxarion of Constantinople, quote, on the first Sunday of Lent, we commemorate the Holy Prophet Moses and Aaron and Samuel. We assemble in the Holy Great Church, Hagia Sophia. And if we look and we study some of the hymnography of the day, for example, the first Idiomelon at Vespers at the Lord I have cried, the Kyria Kekraxa, the hymn starts by saying, the prophets inspired by the spirit, O Lord, foretold that thou, whom nothing can contain or grasp, was to become a child. And at the, at the prayer of thy prophets in thy compassion, blah, blah, blah. The same thing we find in, in the Doxasticon, references to Moses and Elijah and the three children of Abraham, the three youths. Going back to the gospel pericope of the first Sunday of Lent, 
we see this interesting phrase, and now we understand why it was selected for the Sunday of the prophets. In verse 45, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. I think now we see how we must study the liturgical year in order to understand somehow the selection of the pericopes. <clears throat> now the second Sunday, the Sunday of the second week. On this day, according to the old Synaxarion of Constantinople, we read that the great church had a commemoration of St. Polycarp of Smyrna. According to the rubrics of that day, the priest is also to, is supposed to read what is called the Logos Prosponiticos. And this is a translation of part of it. It's an announcement. My children, in truth, beloved, deeply beloved, knowing your sincere faith in Christ and the measure of your, your reverence for holy baptism, those who wish to bring to the salutary baptism of Christ, those who are dear to you, let them lead them here to the holy churches so that it may be possible to protect, to properly instruct the catechumens in the divine teachings according to the rules of faith. This is read every year in the second week, on the second Sunday of Lent. And the gospel pericope of that day is the bringing of the paralytic to Christ. And they became bringing him a paralytic carried by four men. So this is kind of an image of people bringing the catechumens to the church. And when their faith, these are words from the Logos Prophet. He said that the paralytic son, your sins are forgiven. <clears throat> I'm moving through the weeks so we could get an idea of what what the context is on the sunday of the third week of the fast on this sunday after the trisagion of the doxology we make the following formal announcement according to the tipicon i urge your charity of beloved brothers and sisters if you have anyone who must approach holy baptism knowing that the resurrection of christ is drawing near to bring him from tomorrow to our most holy church that he may receive the seal of christ and be kept and catechized for those who would be brought in on purpose this week, be aware that without examination, unless there is an obvious necessity, we will not tolerate their admission. So you have to bring the catechumens on the third Sunday of Lent, Sunday of the of the Holy Cross. And from the patristic, see that there's an intimate connection between the cross and the baptism. This is a small passage from homily 25, of St. John Chrysostom on the Gospel of Matthew. At the end, look, we, we could read the, the, last, the last line here, the last phrase. And not only is baptism called a cross, but the cross is called baptism. And that's why we have the reading of the pericope from the Gospel of Matthew. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whomever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. So we have the cross, the gospel, regaining life, dying and becoming alive in the third Sunday of Lent and the adoration of the precious life giving cross. We all know it, talking about the wood of the cross, quenching the fires of the fiery sword uh, at the gate of heaven. And on Monday, the following day, begin the process of making the catechumens. And we read the prayer of making a catechumen. And there's a, there's a phrase from the Tipicon of Hagia uh, Sophia of the uh, 10th century saying that from this day till, the good, till good Friday, exorcisms are repeated over the cate cate catechumens. We all know the first catechumen. We read it every time we celebrate uh, a, a baptism. Look at this reference to the tree. The Lord who on the tree crushed the hostile powers. And then later in the, in the first exorcism, I adjure you by God who revealed the tree of life and set it in, play, in place and set in place the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned this way 
and that to which turn this way and that to guard it be rebuked and withdraw so we have an exorcism a reference to the tree of life uh, to the cross just like we had in the contagion of the previous sunday and on the fourth sunday this the sunday after the beginning of the exorcisms we have the exorcism of the dumb and deaf spirit when the healing of the boy with the unclean spirit takes place and the father comes and says to him he says to christ can you help me if you can do something he says christ says if i can all things are possible to him who believes we have the content of faith belief in christ faith in christ immediately the father of the child cried out i believe help my unbelief this is what is being said by the catechumens as he's struggling with with his faith and then christ turns and rebukes the unclean spirit saying to it you dumb and deaf spirit i command you come out of him and never enter him again this is being said over the catechumens um, during this period as well and finally just a small reference to the fifth Sunday pericope, the, the gospel pericope for the fifth Sunday of Lent, when, he's, when Christ is again foretelling his death and the resurrection, and we have the request of James and John, the, the disciples. We see also here the biblical language. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or, be bat, or to be baptized with the baptism, baptism which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. And then Christ goes on to say to the, um, to, to the, to the disciples that you're not going to lord it over them just like the Gentiles. The, the Christian is to be great if he is the servant of all. Whosoever would be first among you must be the slave of all, the rulers, the bandon. And the son of man also came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom of many. So Father, going back to Father, where we began, Father, two more, two, one, one more, one more minute, Father, I'm done. No, okay, no, so, I wanted to give you two, a chance to breathe because you've been talking, you've been giving so the, much information. The That's two objectives, I'm finishing, I'm, I'm done. I'm Father. Not Paris, Father. Okay, <laughs> the two objectives uh, of preaching are evangelization, uh, evangelization and ecclesial formation, which means baptism return to the baptismal fall either to receive the labor of regeneration or to renew our baptism through repentance so i ask your your eminence dear fathers and concelebrants um that we all taste and me especially the the spirit-filled fruits of of the renewal of life in christ crucified and resurrected amen Carlo Pasca. Amen. <clears throat> thank you Thank you, Father Christopher. A very, a very uh, thought-provoking presentation. Father, Father Christopher? Uh, just a, a couple of real quick things. Number one, uh, will we have access to this presentation? Because it was really a treasure chest filled with information. And some of us who are a little older will not remember all those things, nor can we write as fast. So can we have a copy of that? Can you make that available to us? I could I could put it in a PDF and send it to you if you like. Okay, that would be good. And then or, if, yes. or if you if you want if you want it, I could I could also like provide more like bibliographical information and put it in some type of yes yes that order, would be like good. notes or something. Now, for those of us who live in the Google world, I'm in San Jose, so I'm right next to Google here. Um, we live in a <laughs> time when we have the sermon of the day. Here's here's how simple I've become. We have the sermon of the day, we have the pericopia of the day, and then we may have a thought or something that comes through that, that's hopefully given to us through the Holy Spirit. Is there a way, Father, to search all or some of these resources so that we can grab the little pearls that are in there and put them in a sermon? Or is it a matter of painstaking still of reading every text, reading every manuscript and drawing it together? Please tell us that something has happened in that direction. Well, I mean, those the, the ancient Christian uh, commentaries are very helpful, especially the ones that are, you know, based on the specific, you know, verses. You could you could pick something, for example, from Chrysostom or from Augustine or from Basil the Great mm -hmm. and use that as a basis to maybe expand it uh, and 
give it in a different kind of um, Are those format. available online? Are those available online? Is there a search engine that you can use for those things or not? No, you just, you have to go through, you have to buy the books and then look at them. And okay, we're still in that, in that mode. Okay, I just wanted to ask that question. I'm hoping someday that one of you will come up with a resource uh, to help us out because we are in the trenches of life here. And uh, sometimes we don't have the time to do all the great research we need to do, we should do. This is, it, I mean, the, 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 the helpful thing with these, with, these, with these books is that, you know, they're all there and, and, and you, could, you could use them quite easily. Um, in, in other words, you don't have to go through all the, you know, the patristic writings to figure out something. They've kind of collected them and it's, it's kind of easy to find um, notes and thoughts on these, on these passages. On this maybe, maybe in the future when His Eminence and His Grace gives us more direction, we could actually create maybe one or two or three of these and we can create, uh, we want to develop right online with you uh, a sermon de dealing with that specific pedicopy and how you go through mm -hmm. that. I think that mm -hmm. would be very helpful, but I don't want to, I don't want to um, take all this. I want others to ask oh, questions too. There is a, there is a nice oh, comment. The There's a nice comment in the chat. Mm -hmm. Would you mind reading it for everybody? I think that is a very nice comment by Father. Father Mike, Father Mike. Yeah, that's great. I didn't know that. Logo Software has all these books available on their app. It, yes. it is also known as Faith Life Software. I use them all the time. There you are. You got your answer. Thank you. But there is another comment from uh, another father. Please. Here talking about uh, our propensity of using ready-made situations to to do it, to to put a, a sermon together. Yes. And this is a very nice, this is to take, I, many of us, we take the storytelling or TED talk method of providing our own parables to those of the Lord's pericope. He's asking, do you have any advice or words to offer in this regard, perhaps how we can avoid taking the, the focus away from the pericope or how such flexibility may have been accepted or rejected historically in Orthodox homiletics? Well, one thing I would suggest is to keep the homily right after the gospel. And that will help us maintain a connect connection to the gospel pericope. Um, another helpful tool, so to speak, and a discipline that I find personally helpful is to alternate between preaching on the gospel one year and then the next year preaching on the apostolos reading. We don't, we don't do that very often because it's hard. And when you do a homily on the apostolos, you have to really work, but that helps you create a discipline of working on the homily. And that way the following year, when you, you go back to the the gospel pericope, you have that discipline in place and you work throughout the week to prepare your sermon. So this is also something that could be helpful, especially like as his eminence said in the beginning, we are the same people with the same congregation year in, year out, preaching on the same texts. So by alternating between the gospel and the, the apostolos, that also gives some type of um, variety and uh, flexibility that's and good refreshment that's good other questions dear brothers that you might have please <laughs> we don't get to speak to father chrysostom often unfortunately but uh, if you have questions please father andrew let's go to the lights thank you um can you uh, just speak a little bit about <clears throat> is there or what is the difference between preaching and teaching This is um, a very, very good question, Father. It's good to see you. To <laughs> you as well. Yeah. Um, there are many different ways to, to approach this question. Like I said earlier, we have this kind of understanding there's a difference between evangelization and ecclesial formation. And evangelization, you know, technically, 
goes under the preaching kind of category and ecclesial formation more on the teaching and upbuilding category. But these, these, are, these are not, I mean, technical terms that are like, you know, this is, you know, teaching is this and preaching is that. So especially because, you know, we're Orthodox, <laughs> we stay away from kind of these kind of clear cut definitions of, the, of these terms. Um, I guess maybe teaching would be more extra liturgical, like outside of the liturgical context, you know, where we have more time for discussion and reflection and open um, kind of uh, thought processes going on and uh, discourse with, with people that we're in touch with or in a Bible study. So that's more maybe geared towards teaching. And then the preaching is more like, you know, the, the formal kind of liturgical homily kind of thing, maybe. But Thank there are you. no clear cut definitions as far as this, these are concerned and use of the consistent use of these, these categories. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm not used to speaking in English. I usually teach in Greek, so <laughs> forgive me for not being as, as uh, you know, smooth in, in, in my uh, presentation here, but pretty good to it's me. A, it's a chance for me to, to uh, also <laughs> practice. <laughs> speaking Holy in Fathers, Holy Fathers, other questions? <laughs> and I keep Father Chris's thumb up late tonight. Father Chris, we had a, a question that was submitted in advance. Probably. Was, uh, Father Theodore, who asked for um, comments on incorporating an ex explanation of the divine liturgy within the sermon. Yes, that's that's also that's also something that is done. Um, also, we also could uh, perhaps do a series on the lives of the saints of the day because usually they they fall on different times throughout the year you know for example like just it happens for example this this sunday you know in the summertime you know, maybe instead of doing a series on matthew when it's the phase you know the period of of the pericopes from matthew we could say that we'll dedicate this time from pentecost to um the feast of the cross on the saints that happen to be falling on that particular Sunday. So the divine liturgy is also another another thing. But as long as as long as we have it, it's it's relevant. And it's not just simply like, you know, for me, I don't know, I don't know what what your experience is, fathers, and I, I would like to hear some of your thoughts on this. I kind of avoid this like, oh, what should what should I talk about on Sunday thing and just try to figure out something out and unless there's a really pressing issue in your parish that needs to be addressed, I would stay somewhat more close to the liturgical and you know the, the biblical texts that are offered by the church and try to weave that into the problems that you know people are facing and the the the, the, the place where where my church my parish is is found in a, in a specific period of time. This as you know was our third in a series, first with Hank Hanegraaff, then with Father Barnabas Powell, and now, of course, with Father Chrysostom Nasis. We thank Metropolitan Erasmus and Bishop John for their guidance and their encouragement to do these things. I would probably uh, urge our brothers to take some, I'm sure they did take some notes uh, from Father Chrysostomus' presentation. So I think uh, there is a great deal of, uh, of treasured uh, material that he presented to us uh, that that will make uh, your uh, uh, work in preaching the gospel even more uh, uh, profound and more uh, uh, instructive. That is my prayer. I want to thank uh, Father Chrysostomus for staying up late. Now it's 12 o'clock. It's the next day almost for him. Uh, I know that he is a beloved graduate from our seminary and a person who is uh, carrying uh, the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America in his heart. And he has a name, the Ecumenical Patriarchate, and all of us, and it has a place in our hearts. Many thanks to Father Christophorus Petropoulos and to the group. Uh, Noel and all the OCN people who have been kind enough to put uh, this uh, uh, series together. 
it has become, um, at least for me, a revelation in many ways of how I should be more careful how I preached and what do I preach on it. I hope that uh, this whole uh, series will be um, just the beginning uh, in the collaboration between uh, our metropolis and the OCN uh, in other themes, but this is a very important one. And I thank you, Father Christopher, for making us Our pleasure. Um, participants in this. Uh, many thanks to all of you. Uh, we have some um, Father Chrysostomus, my personal greetings and warm wishes to you and to your family. And I'm sure that I am speaking on behalf of everyone here uh, that uh, we wish you and your family a blessed Holy Week and a joyous and fruitful spiritually Pascha. And pray for us. Pray for all of us as we pray for you as well. Thank you. Thank you, Your Eminence. And uh, I, I hope some of this was 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 helpful and uh, useful. It um, has been helpful. I, 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 these, these things are, for me, they're really exciting. And uh, I'm very grateful to, to the Lord that I have the opportunity to study these things and share some of these things with you. And, of course, to you, Your Eminence, who was kind enough to to invite me to speak to beloved fellow brothers in Christ who are in the trenches every day, struggling to keep the voice of orthodoxy alive in their hearts and in their parishes and in the world. Thank you for your inspiration. I know many of you and I, I, I respect you and I love you and please keep me and my, my family in your prayers. And uh, thank you for the opportunity for this uh, kinonia and this fellowship. That's very glad. Thank, thank you. Carlo Pasca. A piece is Pater Chrysostomi. I know that uh, my brother priests here, those of you who, have, who know you personally and those of you who know you through other means, very much uh, honor you and were very, uh, you're very respected. Uh, and, and, and a humble servant of God, stay that way. We'll pray to God that you will. Amen. Hello, Pascha. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Reverend Fathers, we have a few more things to deal before we finish. Uh, there are some details here that we need to do. Uh, there are some announcements and then some reminders from His Grace about some work that we are. Uh, uh, preparing to have going forward. Uh, first of all, uh, the next meeting of our um, gathering, it will be May 5th. May 6th. May 6th, excuse me, you have May 5th here. May 5th, is, a, May 5th, 5th is the vicars and May 6th is the, uh, the clergy. No, you made a mistake, Bishop. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, May 6th then. May 6th, we have the next meeting of the clergy. Uh, they, because they intervene in uh, Fridays and times are all of them uh, <clears throat> going to be preoccupied with a great deal of uh, activities both liturgically and otherwise. Um, uh, I'd like to announce a couple of things to you for your own uh, and benefit and also for you to be able to pray and to wish well first to Father John Magulias who is, um, uh, has requested that he uh, uh, take leave from his uh, active duty as an active priest as of this coming summer. And I probably should ask him to say a few words about his decision to do so. Because Father John has been a part of this group and in many other ways in, in our midst. Father John. Your blessing, Your Eminence, and uh, just allow me to thank Father Chrysostomos. It's so wonderful to see him after all these years, and we appreciate the presentation. And um, I know that we all realize we need to learn every day. And we thank you, Father Chrysostomos, to you and your family. I love you. Um, my retirement is from active parish ministry. 
I hope to continue to have the strength and the good health to be active uh, so that no one thinks that there is some health issue that is forcing me into retirement. Um, of course, I do have a serious health issue that I continue to watch after the cardiac episode I had almost six years ago or five years ago. Um, and with your prayers have been doing very well. But um, after discussion with my family, after much prayer, uh, after almost 46 years of active priestly ministry serving the parishes, serving the church, the archdiocese, uh, I didn't want to lose the opportunities while I have the health to enjoy my children and grandchildren, to travel a little bit, and to break away from some of the everyday responsibilities we have in the parish and to uh, focus on other aspects of ministry. Hopefully I'll be able to um, continue to work in different capacities within the church in America. Um, hopefully I'll be able to fill in should there be a need in our area. Um, but it'll give me the chance to go and give my brother-in-law, Father Peter Salmas, a hard time, uh, my son-in-law, Father Michael, a hard time, to visit my son uh, where he may be serving um, and to be able to enjoy the fellowship of them. But again, with all of my brother priests, wherever they may be around the country. Um, I ask for your prayers. Uh, for me, but especially for Presbyteria, who will have to be putting up with me and will be seeing me more often uh, than she's used to over these 46 plus years. And uh, again, pray that our Lord will give you the strength to continue in your ministry. Thank mm -hmm. His Eminence for the support and for the understanding. It may not be coming at the best time in our metropolis. But again, after reflection, after prayer, it, it is a good time for our family. So um, you continue to be in my prayers, all of you. And uh, I pray that the remaining time of this holy season of Great Lent may strengthen all of us, uh, that we may truly come to live in the resurrection of our Lord and that his light may shine in our hearts. Uh, to to serve the people of God with faith and with love. Thank you, Reminds. Thank you, Father John, for your beautiful words. And you must know that you will be in our thoughts and our prayers all the time. And we are expecting to see you uh, more than uh, uh, any other, uh, like I, we see Father, Co Father Constantine Estatiu, uh, and, uh, and to enjoy you uh, because you are a part of this body of Christ and you and you Presbytera, which indeed I feel I feel a little bit sorry for her because she's going to have to put up with you on a more basis for sure but above all you have been a good and faithful servant of the of God and for all of us that is a, 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 a the most the blessing that we have by your presence stay well and healthy um yeah. The other, the other gentleman, and I call him gentleman because like Father Magulias, he is also a person who has uh, uh, created his own uh, reputation amongst our brothers here. In, and he is a, a wonderful pastor and shepherd, is Father, Father Kiriakou, Stephen Kiriakou, who is also is going to be retiring between now and the summer. Um, I know that I'm not sure if he is in the call today, but I know that we sent to him uh, our best prayers. His health is getting better. He was a little bit uh, challenged in that, but now he's getting better. And we're hoping that he's going to be also a, a presence in our midst uh, for a for long time to come, like Father John Magulius. So many prayers for him as well. Um, I have for the brothers here one or two comments, and then I'm going to turn it over to His Grace for some other issues before we finish. Um, 
we talked about the, these two uh, faithful stewards of God who are retiring. The bishop and I sat down and we made, a, we start counting. Tomorrow morning, we need nine priests in the metropolis to be able to cover things that, I mean, places and, 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 and the flock, to teach, to teach and to bring the sacraments and to bring the love of God to people. Why am I saying that? It's because it is up to all of us, especially my brothers to you, because you have an access to that to consciously cultivate young people to come forward for the holy sec and sacred calling of being a priest. I know that even Father Chrysostomus, if I'm not mistaken, was inspired by a priest. He, became, he came to the seminary. I know many of you have done that. Uh, what I'm asking from you, please, 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 look around you, the altar, the acolytes, the altar boys you have in the altar. Look around you, you're going to see the sparkle in someone's eye. You just need to have one or two. Mentor the person. Bring him closer to you. Pay special attention. Make them feel that they have something special, which they do, some of the, our children. So please, uh, in, in the metropolis uh, side, we're going to consciously do an effort on this issue and asking all of you to participate as we go forward uh, to uh, some retreats, pandemic permitting of acolytes to have together so that we can be able to cultivate people to get the phronima and what the church, the Greek Orthodox Church in America is all about. The next uh, as, item that I like to ask you to ponder and at the appropriate time to uh, respond to us, we have many ministries in the metropolis level offering to you, be it the family care ministry, be it uh, uh, the missions and evangelism ministry, be it um, the issues of uh, leadership, lay leadership ministries. I want to know how much effective these ministries have been to your own work. Are they been offered to you and have you used that, utilized them? And if you do, what it has been your experience? If you don't, what do you think that we should do? So I'm, I'm just putting this question out there because I think it's time for us to reflect what we offer to our brothers, that is you as a metropolis, if it's worth offering it or we should do something different. I'm, I'm trying to get this, this question to you, and I will do so in a little bit more concrete way as we go forward. But have that in mind. The third item that I want to say, and then I'm going to finish, is you received, or you're supposed to receive, uh, a copy of the survey for uh, that was done regarding the study or survey, whatever you call it, uh, about the charter of our archdiocese. And you were asked to give your opinions. The same thing has happened with the Paris Council presidents. They received the copy of that. Please, please, please read carefully what they sent you, make your own observations, and put those observations in a form that they can be able to be instructive and effective and send it in. Don't wait too long. We need to have that. Having said that, I want to ask His Grace to see he has a couple more things to offer to you before we close for today. Your Grace. Uh, thank you, Your Eminence. Uh, my brothers, uh, welcome to uh, the... Uh, I'm glad that you have uh, taken the opportunity to be part of the Art of Preaching series uh, in conjunction with the OCN. Thank you, Father Christopher Metropolis, for uh, arranging these uh, fine speakers, and I know that I have taken uh, my notes. Uh, in what His Eminence, I want to follow up uh, with His Eminence um, said regarding uh, future clergy. There are two programs that are available to. Um, one available to the 
juniors and seniors of our uh, parishes, and that is the, uh, uh, the Crossroads program. And that will be in uh, July here in the metropolis of San Francisco. Uh, there are still spots uh, available for uh, our juniors and seniors. And the second is the uh, semester of faith, uh, which is geared toward uh, college students uh, going up to uh, Holy Cross and experiencing life there. Okay, uh, Your Eminence. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Grace, for that, Reverend Fathers, and my brothers in the Lord. Please pray for each other as we approach this holy and God say soul saving period of Holy Week and Pascha. Pray for each other that God will give us the forgiveness of our sins. We have many times become instruments of the evil one. It is time for us, right now, even in the 11th hour, to come closer to God by forgiving. And with that in mind, and wishing you the most blessed and meaningful spiritually holy week and pascha let us pray O eternal and perfect wisdom as we bow our heads before you we beseech you enable us to profit from this lenten season as we approach your holy passion the crucifixion and your glorious resurrection by persevering to the end in earnestness and purity of heart, so that ever safe and sound in soul and body, we may persevere with confidence in glorifying your wondrous and blessed name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever and to the ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Your, your Eminence, I would like to express my gratitude to you for your blessings for Father Zemeris from Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology, who came to speak at our parish for our parish retreat. He sends his, be his best wishes to you and long life, Bola Eti. And again, I do too, is Bola Eti Vespota. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you, Father Theodore. Thank you. My brothers, have a beautiful and, and productive weekend and going forward healthy and strong in spirit strong in faith holy week and pascha father christopher metropolis we thank you so much for bringing Pleasure. us a beautiful a beautiful gift today father chrysostomos may god bless us all thank you i mean well there is thank you hello pascha hello pascha hello pascha